Hi, I hope that you're having a lovely week. This is my webinar number three. The first one contains tips, last minute tips for those of you who are planning to take STANAC exam anytime soon. The second one is about vocabulary. And this one, the one that we're going to host today, is about writing skills. More specifically, we are going to talk about writing reports. Report is the form of writing that is required from students both on level two and level three. And today I wanna teach you how to write jaw dropping reports. This session is gonna take around one hour. So grab yourself a cup of tea or coffee, wherever you prefer, get, get comfortable and let's get started. First things first, this session, in this session, we are going to analyze an uh, already existing report. This report uh, is definitely way longer than the report that you're supposed to write in the exam. But I thought that the topic of this report, as well as the structures that are used in it, might be quite interesting to analyze and that we can learn a lot from it. You're going to get a, a PDF with the full version of this report, so you, it would be really a good idea to read it before you watch this webinar or right after watching this webinar, so you know what, what I'm talking about. Uh, there'll be some moments when I will ask you to pause the video and take a moment to read what's on your screen. And, and there'll be some quizzes and yeah, let's keep it fun. Today's topics are, we're gonna start with introduction to Stanek report writing, some essential inf information that you need to know about it. We're going to analyze the structure, grammar, formal vocabulary, collocations, phrasal verbs, and verbs and prepositions that we can find in this report, as well as linking words. Let's start with a quiz. This way you can find out how much you know about writing reports. Some of these things might be quite obvious for some of you if you have been writing reports for a while, but for the newbies, uh, some of them might not be so clear. I'm going to give you the answers to these questions at the end of this session. But first, I would like you to write down your answers on a sheet of paper. Number one, the conclusion should link clearly to the rest of the report with an appropriate linking word or phrase. Number two, reports should state their aims in the first paragraph. Number three, the writer should not include his or her opinion until the conclusion. Number four, a report uses dramatic and informal language. And number five, phrasal verbs cannot be used in a report. Write down the answers, if it's true or false, what you think, and I'm gonna give you the answers in more or less one hour. Basic info. A report is an informative, formal piece of writing which concerns a particular situation, issue, or an event. The topic and uh, purpose of the report re depends on the task and also on the level. On the level two, the task will be a little bit more down to earth, factual, while on the level three, it will be more a global topic geopolitical one and it will require much more knowledge from you. It is usually addressed to one's commanding officer, superior or colleagues. So it's really important that you know who, you, who you're writing to. You have to keep this person in mind during the whole writing process. And finally, it is written in response to a request or instruction. Later on, we are going to take a look at some examples. Formal register. So you probably know that you're supposed to write your report using formal language. 
But what does it mean exactly? Apart from not using short forms, you're also not supposed to ask direct questions. You're not supposed to use the second person form of you, such as what you can get from it, uh, forget about this imaginary you. Speakers of many languages have the, the tendency to overuse this you form, but this is a very direct way of talking to someone, which makes it not really appropriate form for a report, which is meant to be impersonal. Use one instead. What one can get from it. <laughs> and of course, you're supposed to use passive form as much as possible. Let's say that this is like number one grammar requirement uh, as far as the report is concerned. Let's talk about different types of reports. We can be asked to write an assessment report, an informative report, or a proposal report. The, there are slight differences between them that you can read on the slides. So the first thing that you need to do is to identify the purpose of your report. Before you start writing, you need to know what's the purpose of your report and then you decide on the type that you use. We're going to compare level two and level three reports. Uh, I get these questions quite, quite a lot from students. What is actually a difference between a level two and level three report? Because this task appears on both levels. Basically, level two reports, well, th there are three areas of difference, topics, layout, and language that you're supposed to use. So let's discuss the, the topics first. On the level two, you are asked to talk about everyday topics, both military and general topics, but this is something more concrete, practical. While on the level three, you are asked to write, write about geopolitical, social issues, uh, including the military one, but not necessarily layout so that the way your report looks on a level two you're supposed to write shorter paragraphs obviously because you are supposed to write less words and on a level three you're supposed to use more complex sentences and longer paragraphs this does not mean that on a level two you're not supposed to use complex sentences but on the level two, you can kind of mix them with the simple sentences, so that's fine. But on the level three, you're supposed to use exclusively complex sentences. So a very important aspect of that is to learn how to combine two shorter sentences in one and to make it a complex one. One of the ways of doing that would be using relative clauses or linking words. Let's talk about the language. On level two, you're supposed to use less advanced grammar structures. I mean, you can still use the level three exam structures, but it is not a must in order to pass the exam. Uh, still, passive voice is something that you're expected to use. So don't skip that part. While on the level three, you're supposed to use passive, of course, but also it would be a fantastic idea to use conditionals, especially the third conditional, because you're supposed to hypothesize, speculate uh, both about future and about past. And using model verbs might be also quite handy on this level. Let's analyze some examples of the level two tasks. So you're asked to write a report to your commanding officer. A NATO pilot had to eject over hostile territory. Your unit was tasked with rescuing him. Describe the mission, include the following points. Time, date, location, your unit's actions, a problem that occurred and what was done to solve it, and the pilot's condition. So as you can see, you're supposed to talk about a concrete situation and describe different 
details of that. And the second task is very similar. So when you're working on that report, remember that at the end, you should check if you, if you fulfilled all of these tasks, if you included all the information, if you haven't skipped like a part of this task, maybe you wrote about time and date, but you forgot the location part, make sure that you included all these parts. We can see how different is the task on the level three. Uh, let's take a look at one of them. A NATO research group is carrying out an investigation into soldiers' basic training in different countries. You have been asked to write a report about this training in the Polish armed forces. Include the following points. This is taken from the Polish exam. That's why the exam is about Polish armed forces. Uh, of course, if you're not Polish, if you're taking the exam in a different country, this would refer to your own country, whether it's Spanish or Italian or some other country. And what you're asked to do in this task is to describe the basic training Polish soldiers go through. So you need to have knowledge about it. You need to know more about this topic. Assess its strengths and weaknesses. So they expect you to assess something. Suggest how it should be improved. So they want you to make recommendations, suggestions. So as you can see, it's quite different than the level two exam. It's not just reporting facts and situations, but they expect from you some higher thinking skills. Okay, let's jump into the analysis of the re report about NATO's response to COVID-19. We're going to break it down into different parts and go through it like step by step. First of all, title. Don't forget that your report needs a title. Okay, th this makes it quite different from other types of writing, right? Like formal letters or essays, because they do not uh, need to have a title, but your report does. And your report also, need, you need to state the, the aim of your report in the first paragraph, in the first sentence of your report. So here is, for example, the aim of the report that we are going to analyze today, to provide a critical assessment of NATO's preparedness and response to COVID-19 and provide reflections on how lessons learned from this pandemic could help to manage and prevent similar future crises. Here are some other ideas how you can start your report. Uh, you're also going to get a PDF with this presentation, so um, you can take notes in your notebook if that works for you, but you also have like a digital version with all these notes from me. So the verbs that we want to use is to contain, outline, examine, assess. These are the, the, the verbs that we want to go for. This is something that I already mentioned, that you have to identify the purpose of your report. You need to think if it's an informative one, assessment report and proposal or proposal. Here we have some other examples of the, the aims of the reports, what you can assess, evaluate, examine, make recommendations, put forward ideas and provide an overall view of something. You can copy some of these expressions and use them in your reports. Now, your report also needs subheadings. Every section needs a proper name. That also makes it quite different from other types of writings that do not require that. You're asked to make recommendations in most of the reports that you write. Both It may happen both on the level two and on the level three. Here are some expressions that you can use when you're making recommendations on level two. And here are some expressions that you can um, find in order to make recommendations on the level three. These ones are slightly more advanced. 
So the grammatical structures that are used here are more advanced. Uh, I will go back to the previous slide to show you the, the difference. These sentences usually start with a subject, verb, and in the level three, we are trying to play a little bit about the sentence structure, make it sound more native-like and natural and advanced. Mm -hmm. Here we have, this is actually the first screenshot from the, from the NATO report. And you can see that in this part, I think that my, my highlighter moved a little bit here uh, because I wanted to underline the part. It is critical for NATO allies to build a common vision and they, they need to become more global. And to do so, it is paramount for the US and Europe to develop a common stance towards China, increase efforts to fight terrorism. It is therefore a paramount importance that the Alliance rethink the defense spending requirement. So here you can see some expressions that we can use instead of saying it is important to. Okay, we can express it in a little bit different way. Uh, it is therefore of paramount importance. That's a fantastic expression that you can use instead of it is important to. Um, and yeah, quite a few other expressions that, that you can steal from that report. Yeah, basically use this report as an inspiration source. Here we have some other ways to end a report, to summarize it, and a general assessment of a report. Now, sometimes the task may require including some statistics. And you're not going to be given any statistics, so you basically have to make them up. Which means that you have to carry out an imaginary survey in your head with imaginary participants and come up with the figures and discuss them. So, in, it's not in every task, but you can find some tasks when you are supposed to talk about uh, public opinion on certain areas, for example, Polish society opinion on military service. So you're supposed to include some statistical data. And don't worry about it because it does not have to be accurate. Like it's a opinion survey, so you can include like your own opinions here like as the opinions of respondents showing like some percentages maybe just try to not be very extreme with those statistics with those ideas try to come up with something reasonable and quite logical try to really reflect how the society might be thinking about this topic and you've got some good expressions that you can use in this part of the exam. Here are some statistics that are taken from the NATO report. Uh, many of them are used like in the passive form, like in this one, that the training and exercises were reduced by 33%. Okay. Another way to talk about a reduction is that the Defender program saw a significant reduction in size and scope. And then we have another way to discuss data. Data from uh, the source reports sh uh, shows that, and then we report the numbers. Okay, let's talk about grammar that you're supposed to use in your report. Uh, as I have already mentioned, passive voice is one of the most important aspects of grammar to use in your report. Examiners will be paying a lot of attention whether you use passive voice or not. So here you have some examples of passive voice being used in a one paragraph of the uh, NATO's response to COVID report. So one here, 
All of them are in past simple, but in the next slide, you're going to see a bigger variety of passive and I'm going to have a special task for you. So here we've got some examples like that the pandemic was quickly, quickly understood, cooperation was initially put under severe stress, and NATO was impacted by COVID-19, as well as the operations were scaled down. Okay, so these are some fantastic examples of passive. As you can see, we've got accumulation of passive sentences in this short paragraph, four of them in such short text, which shows us that this is something that is expected from you and also commonly used in real reports, not just the exam reports, but the exam, but the reports that people write. Now, this is a task for you. So I would like you to find all the examples of passive voice in this text. I would like you to underline all of them. And at the end of this video, I'm going to tell you how many examples of passive voice we can see in this short paragraph. Just uh, pay attention because they are being used in many different verbal tenses. So pause the video, take a moment to read them, and I will see you right back like in a minute or depending how much time you, you need for that. Conditionals. This is something that is expected from you on the level three, but it would not harm use it on the level two as well. Why not? And in, in this short paragraph, you have some example of mixed conditionals. This is also showing that you know how to use conditionals effectively when you're able to mix the second conditional and the third conditional uh, in the same sentence. So take a look, uh, take a look at this example, read it, analyze it, and I'm going to move on to the next section. Model verbs. In this report, I could find many fantastic examples of model verbs. So for example, will was used in this report to make predictions. Don't forget that apart from the future reference, like will is also used to make future predictions. Uh, in, this, in this paragraph, there are some examples of it about, about uh, the future of the audience that it will be margin the impact sorry the the virus impact on the future of nature will be marginal uh, that's a prediction will be and another prediction is that nature survival and success in responding to global challenges will ultimately be contingent on a relaunch of transatlantic relations will be okay that's a prediction if we want to make a little bit um, less convinced prediction, like if we want to show that uh, we're not 100% sure what's going to happen, we could use may or might. This way, the prediction is not going to be so strong. It's going to um, leave some space for, for a doubt. Here is a great example of that. With GDP plummeting worldwide, going down, Policymakers and public opinion may be reluctant to support an increase in defense spending. Maybe. Okay, this is kind of we are securing ourselves, like to say that we are not 100% sure if that may happen. We are expressing a future possibility. Okay. Uh, must. When we want to make a strong recommendation, we should use must. So this is like a bit stronger version of should. Must is also used to talk about obligation, but in this context, it's used to make a strong recommendation. NATO must further enhance its crisis management toolkit. Then we have a classic should to make recommendation or to give advice. Uh, another alternative, alternative to should could be ought to. 
This one is a bit more formal version of shoot, so it could also be used in this type of writing. But the author decided to go for a classic shoot. Shoot is not informal. It's neutral. So it's not a mistake to use should in your formal writing, but if you want to level up your writing, you can also use ought to. So this, the example of a sentence that we have here with should is uh, NATO and its member states should not miss the opportunity that the COVID-19 crisis offers, or that they should expand the concept of security. So this is a recommendation, but not as strong as the one that we have seen before with must. Have to is used to express obligation. We don't use it to, to make recommendations uh, in this context. So to prevent further spread of COVID-19, some training and exercises activities had to go through limitations uh, and redesigning. So here we are trying to say that uh, they were forced to do that, but um, we're talking about the, the exercises during the, the exercises and uh, some trainings during COVID-19. There are some advanced structures that you have probably noticed also in the exercise where you had to identify passive like this one. So starting the sentence in a slightly different way. Having already been suspended. So this is an example of a special form of passive here. So we have having been plus past participle here. So that's like a very advanced structure. So that's um, for the level three. You don't have to use this structure if, you, if it doesn't feel natural for you yet, but that's a fantastic way to break a little bit this classic sentence structure of a subject, verb, and object. Past perfect. This sentence is actually a fantastic example of incorporating past perfect in your writing. The audience had no prior experience with a global pandemic and had never faced a crisis that hit every member state with the same threat at the same time. Fantastic sentence. So as you know, we usually use past simple and past perfect in the same sentence to refer to an activity that happened even earlier. So that's, that's a fantastic example. Relative clauses. So I mentioned relative clauses when I told you about using more complex sentences in your writing. And yes, one of the ways to write more complex sentences is connecting them by using relative clauses. Relative clauses could be which, that, who, whom, and so on and so forth, you know them. So the example that we have here is the relative clause which that connects two sentences that could normally be separated, but they are united here by a relative clause. Now, I know that a lot of you struggle with this aspect, verbs and prepositions. So when you'll be reading this NATO report, I would like you to pay a special attention to this aspect highlight all of the examples of verbs and prepositions that you find in this report and especially pay attention to the context in which they were used because it can show you in what context you can use it in your writing. So I came up with some examples here like the verbs and prepositions with on, like to focus on, to depend on, to rely on, then the ones with from, to prevent from, to result from, to stem from, then to, to resort to, of, to take advantage of something, at, to aim at, in, to invest in or to succeed in, and with, to deal with. And don't forget that after the prepositions, we have to use either a verb or a, 
a verb with ing at the end or a noun. Vocabulary. So you're supposed to use a little bit more formal vocabulary here, a bit more formal versions of the classic verbs that you know. Try to avoid overusing the verb to be because your report will just sound very basic if you keep doing that. Try to substitute the verb to be with contain, require, like every time you spot that again, you use the verb to be, think if you know any other verb that you could use instead of it. Uh, and here are some examples of fantastic expressions. Well, the ones that in my opinion are fantastic expressions that I have found in the report about NATO's response to COVID-19. Uh, here we go. To establish a framework of coordination. Okay, so in, this is like, instead of saying that they should coordinate the, their exercises, their decision-making process to establish a framework of coordination. Fantastic. To broaden the scope of counter disinformation efforts, to ensure continuity of operations, to develop a common stance towards. The, the last one is like a synonym of that they should react, like they, have, they should react all in the same way and that they should have like a common reaction pattern to, to dangers. So to develop a common stance towards something, great expression. Uh, when you'll be reading the report, try to identify those expressions, highlight them and see in what context they were used. Collocations. Uh, I'm a big fan of collocations and I think they are one of the most important aspects of the language. And in order to sound natural, you have to learn collocations because otherwise like you're just translating uh, expressions and sentences from your native language. Collocations make you sound natural in English. So here I came up with some examples of the collocations that I found in this report. And I just thought that you might find them interesting, same as I found them. So we've got to face challenges or to face a crisis, to draw lessons from something, instead of saying that, that they could learn something from this experience. They could draw lessons from this experience. To increase understanding, awareness, efforts, to enhance the flexibility or the quality, to play a role in doing something or in something, to show reliability, solidarity and adaptability, to overcome tensions, to take something for granted. It's time to talk about phrasal verbs in formal writing. So one of the questions that you could find in the quiz, actually the last one, was about phrasal verbs. So I could ask this question quite a lot. Shall we or, sh or shouldn't we use phrasal verbs in our formal writing? The question is most of the, the answer, sorry, the answer is that most of the phrasal verbs are not appropriate to be used in formal writing. However, there are some of them that you can perfectly use in formal writing. There are not many that you could use in formal writing, but there are some. And here I'm bringing you some examples of those. To point out, this is when you're trying to uh, draw attention to the most important aspects of something. Look, the things that I'm writing, I'm writing them with bullet points. Okay, because I'm trying to point out the most important aspects to carry out. This one, uh, I'm sure that you have seen it. You could see it in the tasks, uh, in the level three tasks, in both of them, they were used there. I could see it also in the, uh, in the report. And this is one of the most commonly used phrase of uh, in English, in general English, but also in military Eng English. You can carry out an attack, you can carry out a survey, you can carry out so many different things. This is like a more formal version of do, 
but it doesn't mean that this is like always a synonym of do. Before you use it, check the collocations with carry out, with what nouns it actually collocates. To find out, this is when you want to learn a bit more about the subject. So for those of you who listen to the BBC, uh, no, British Council podcasts, at the end of the podcast, they tell you to find out more, go to, and they say their website, you have to find out more. To look forward to, this one should ring a bell from formal letters. Okay, at the end of formal letters, we use this phrase of up. This means that you're really waiting for something to happen, like with anticipation and to put forward. I used this one in one of the previous slides with ideas, to put forward some ideas, for example. So these are the phrase of apps that you can safely use in your formal writing. Here are some examples of the phrase of apps that I talked about, uh, point out in the text. Uh, turn out is also one I didn't discuss it, but it's also used. This is like when the result uh, is a bit different than you expected. So it comes with some surprise factor. Linking words. This is one of the aspects that students get really obsessed with. And the problem is that they often use them randomly. Okay, they know, they are completely aware that they're supposed to use linking words in their writings. So they take it to an extreme or they're the choice of linking words is quite boring in some texts. So for example, going in every paragraph with firstly, secondly, thirdly, this one like to organize the, the text in order, it's quite boring to be honest or overusing moreover as, as the only linking word that you keep using. Probably not the most attractive uh, linking words that you can use. I would like to show you some examples of great linking words in this NATO report that we are analyzing. And also on the right, you can see the purpose, why uh, this linking word was used. Because remember that you have to use them intentionally with a clear purpose, okay? All of them serve a certain purpose. Uh, so the one that we have here is in spite of or despite. So take a moment to read those examples, pause the video if necessary. And the second one is although, this is like a, a cousin of in spite of and despite, um, both the previous mentioned ones and although, uh, we use them to express contrast. due to. So due to is like a little bit fancier way to say because of. Okay? We use it to indicate the result of something. So instead of using because of, use due to. And remember that after due to, we always have to use a noun. Okay? Due to the pandemic, due to the economical crisis. Okay? So remember that after due to, we have to use a noun. Another way to talk about results is therefore. You know the drill. If you need some time to read it, pause the video and read it. Furthermore is like a more attractive older brother of moreover. So if you really have to, if you really want to use moreover, at least substitute it with furthermore, okay? Here we have an example. Furthermore can be used at the beginning of a sentence or like in the middle of a sentence. Another way to express uh, adding some information, um, here, although this one is also kind of um, showing like two pieces of information, uh, like one of them on a little bit higher level is like on the top of that. 
So we've got Trump not only denied the gravity of the virus, but also, okay, so we like not only this, but also imposed travel bans without coordinating with European allies. Not cool. In fact, is used is used for emphasis. This one is used for illustration. For instance, that's just a prettier way to say, for example, remember that in order to talk about examples, don't use like in your formal writing. Like is a little bit too informal to talk about examples. You can use such as perfectly fine, for instance, for example, but like is more commonly used in speaking rather than formal writing. Okay, so here I come with the answers to, your, to the quiz. The first sentence is true. The second one is true as well, obviously. Number three is true, only if you're asked to include your opinion. Okay, if you're asked to express it, like wait until the end, like guide the reader through all of the data, surveys, and like wait until the end to, to add your comment about it. Number four is obviously false. And number five is false, because we cannot say that we cannot use phrasal verbs in the report. There are some of them that can be used. So this is like an uh, extreme statement. And the answer to the task that you had, when you had to count how many uh, passive voice examples we could find in the text, the answer is there were four. Okay, so it's your turn now. I want this webinar to be also proactive for you. I would like you to apply all of the things that you have learned today in practice. So don't forget that whenever you are working on, a, on writing skills, you have to plan your writing. This is like number one tip that I have for everyone who wants to improve their writing. Plan it. If you don't plan your writing, we have like nothing to, to talk about. You have to do that. Trust me. The examiners, the teachers, like will see clearly who planned their writings and who did not. Don't skip that part. Don't think that you can just go with your stream of consciousness. Don't do that to yourself. Trust the teachers and plan your writings. So first of all, uh, I already talked about this effective writing cycle fr framework in my first webinar, but I just thought that it's, for those of you who haven't seen my first webinar, it's important to include this here again. Understand the task. So as we said, identify what is the purpose of your report, its informative assessment, proposal. Uh, this will kind of show you like what kind of text you have to write. Then plan it. How much time should you spend planning? Five minutes, 10, 15? It depends. Maybe at the beginning it's gonna take you a little bit longer when you'll be still getting into the habit of planning. Then like, I think it will naturally be shorter and shorter with time, but um, take a proper time. I'm not gonna tell you if five is better than 15, but maybe somewhere in the middle, around 10 minutes for a proper planning. Okay, don't think that it's the time that is wasted, that the clock is ticking and that you have to hurry up. Really, when you have a good plan, then the writing will go really smoothly. Then write. Then don't forget to edit your writing. This means that you have to spot mistakes, spot typos, especially if you are writing on a computer keyboard, okay? Because you may make some mistakes that you would not normally not make when you write the text, okay? Because we make mistakes when we type texts much more than it, when it's a handwritten text. So try to spot the typos, 
Uh, try to spot the types of mistakes that you tend to make the most, whether it's spelling, uh, grammar, like forgetting S in the third person. I hope you don't make this mistake anymore, but in case you do and you know that that's something that happens to you from time to time, focus on spotting this type of mistakes that when examiners see them, uh, for example, if you make this kind of mistake on the level three, it might dis disqualify you like from getting level three because this is the information from the examiners that you don't even pay attention to simple grammar rules. Try, try to always pay attention to singulars and plurals and like match them when you use a singular subject, use the singular verb form too and try to be consistent with that. Uh, pay attention to the linking words that you have used, whether they were effective or no. Have like a read your text um, in a kind of judgmental way. Try to judge whether it's a good text or not. Spot the mistakes. Um, be proactive in this part and very critical. And point number five is only if you are doing it as an exercise and your teacher is going to give you some feedback and then Try to apply all of the tips, all of the corrections that your teacher gave you and uh, rewrite your text. Make a better version of the, the first draft. Okay. That's something that I also mentioned that you have to imagine your target reader. Who is the person that you're writing to? Then organize information into topic paragraphs. Think about topic sentences, the first sentence that you're going to write, then support it with some arguments, following this simple writing paragraph structure. Topic sentence, supporting it with some arguments. As simple as that. And remember to concentrate on register and style. So try to pay attention to that. Do not use short forms um, and uh, the choice of vocabulary that you make and the style that you use. You should keep in mind like what is expected from you. And I would like to hear from you. What are some struggles that you have in terms of formal writing? Are there any aspects of writing reports or formal writing that I haven't covered in this webinar? Were you missing something? Would you like me to elaborate on some particular aspects of writing uh, reports or writing in general? Let's keep in touch. Let's keep it as a conversation and let me know if there is anything that you are missing or you're still not sure about, any questions that you may have, DM me, contact me, and I will try to help. Thank you very much for being here with me, for uh, sharing this uh, time together. I hope that you have learned something useful today and that you will be able to apply all this knowledge in practice. And I will see you again in my next webinar because I'm going to keep doing that in this format. So have a lovely day and see you next time. Bye.